the surprise resignation this summer by the state's chief judge, Janet DeFiori, created a vacancy on the New York Court of Appeals, which will be filled by one of seven prospective candidates identified in November by the State Commission on Judicial Nomination. With Governor Kathy Hochul needing to make a selection from this list between December 8th and December 23rd, we wanted to get to know the contenders to run the state's top court. And to do that, we're joined by Vin Bonventry, a professor with Albany Law School, author of the New York Court Watcher blog, and the inspiration for the character of Atticus Finch. Welcome back to the show, Vin. <laughs> Where's the lie, Vin? Where's the, the lie? The last time it was my cousin Vinny, which I actually think is more fitting. Well, we're, we're elevating you here today. Thank you. So this list includes the acting chief judge of the state, uh, Associate Judge Anthony Canataro. What should we know about him? And should he be considered a front runner, considering he would just have to you know, move over one seat? You know, it depends upon exactly how you look at this list. But if you look at it from the point of view that he's the only current member of the New York Court of Appeals on the list, you might say, hmm, they're kind of putting their finger on him and trying to lead the governor to uh, nominate him. Because I'm presuming that there are other judges on the court uh, who had applied for this position, and yet none of them made it. There's the absolutely brilliant um, Rowan Wilson. I'm pretty sure he applied. I can't, uh, well, I think he probably didn't make the list because he dissents so much, although I would say he dissents with good reason from much of what the court's been doing the last several years. Uh, Shirley Troutman, who Governor Hochul actually appointed to a vacancy since she's been governor, I figured that she might be a front runner because she would make the first African-American chief judge, the first uh, black woman chief judge. And that would also create a vacancy for the governor to fill. So that would be two nominations for the governor. So the fact that Conataro is the only one is a very, very curious sign, but I'm not sure exactly what it's signaling. Well, before the nominees were revealed, Governor Hochul published an op-ed in which she identified some of the criteria she's looking for in a chief judge. And this included someone who she said could unite the existing court, considering how Canataro emerged as the candidate to run the court in the absence of De Fiori. Could it be safe to say that he is a consensus builder, that he could be a person who can unite disparate wings of this court? Uh, th- that That's a good point. I mean, that is possible because for the judges to have selected him as the acting chief, and the judges are the ones who do that, that means they passed over, uh, you know, three more senior associate judges I don't know what exactly that means. I don't know that that means that the uh, those three more senior judges actually wanted Conataro or Conataro was the only one who could get three votes and maybe the then chief Janet DeFiori's vote. I, d- I don't know. What, what I do know, however, is that Conataro on the court was part of that four judge block with Chief Judge Janet DeFiori, the four-judge, fairly conservative block. And again, when we talk about conservative Mm -hmm. on the New York Court of Appeals, we're not talking about Justice Thomas or Alito or Gorsuch, right? But still, for the Court of Appeals, pretty conservative, that four-judge block. He was part of that. I can't imagine that Hochul is going to want to uh, upset Uh, The Democratic liberals, especially from downstate, who I can't imagine want her to choose Conataro for that reason. Well, then looking at the remainder of the list, are there any of the other six candidates that stand out to you as someone who the governor might gravitate toward either because of their resume or because of what the governor has identified as her criteria for a a pick, which is, like we said, someone who can unify the court and as well as someone who can manage this very complex court system. 
Right. And and she's also spoken in even more candid moments about restoring the prestige of the court, which tells you what she's been told about the current reputation of the court, which is not particularly high. But uh, if you look at who stands out, you have to start off with the fact that this is a pretty strong list. We don't always get strong lists from the so-called merit commission. You know, <laughs> sometimes, you know, you got a couple of clunkers on, on the list. This is a pretty darn strong list. You know, this Abby Gluck is a professor of both law and medicine at Yale Law School. She also clerked for uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Was your mom uh, disappointed that you only became a law professor and didn't get into medicine as well? <laughs> well, the, both she and my dad were very, very disappointed. I didn't follow my father's path in becoming a physician. But uh, I think once I clerked at the Court of Appeals and got my Supreme Court fellowship, they figured, eh, that's not so bad. Not quite being a physician, but it's not quite so bad. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, you know, when I when they hear that I'm on your show, they, man, they say, well, he's really reached the heights. <laughs> <laughs> well, so Abby Gluck is certainly got an extraordinary resume. Hector LaSalle from the second department, the appellate division, the presiding judge. Boy, he's got a terrific reputation as being a fantastic presiding justice, you know, the leader of that court. And uh, very, very bright guy. The problem there is he was a prosecutor for quite a while. And, you know, a lot of the uh, progressive liberal Democrats in the city may not like that. Although there's not much in his record as a judge to suggest that he's particularly conservative. There's Jeffrey Oing. He's from the first department of the appellate division. I don't know much about him except for the fact that people who do know about him, and I'm talking about them speaking candidly to me, they think he's brilliant. They think he's, he doesn't have much administrative experience. So that may be a mark against him. Then there's my Dean Alicia Ouellette, my former student, who, who can you imagine David, she's had to put up with the law faculty, right? If she could put up with the law faculty, she could put up with anybody. I think she'd be a great consensus builder. Um, she was also editor in chief of our law review when she was a student at the school. I'm faculty advisor to the law review and she was astounding as the editor in chief. I think she'd be great. She's also, she also had worked in the solicitor general's office. So she's literally argued hundreds of appeals. She's a strong candidate. Edwina Richardson Mendelson, the deputy chief administrative judge in New York. She's got a great deal of administrative experience. She's also got a PhD in criminal justice, which I think the progressives would like. She's also African-American, so the governor could make history, as the governor could also make history with LaSalle, the first Hispanic chief judge, or Oing, the first Asian chief judge. There's all kinds of firsts here. And then uh, Corey Stoughton, uh, she's the, uh, you know, the attorney in charge at the Legal Aid Society for Special Litigation. I think the progressives would absolutely love her. Very, very capable. She's got a great reputation. This is a strong list, David, a strong list. Well, yeah, you, you've touched on this with some of the candidates, uh, whether it's uh, Hector LaSalle and his past his experience as a former prosecutor or Corey with uh, Legal Aid Society and uh, how they are someone who's championed by progressive criminal justice advocates. How much stock should we put in the voice of groups on the left who are looking to weigh in on both the governor's decision as well as the confirmation process? I mean, historically, have they been influential or have they been loud but not really able to guide this final decision? You know, Governor Hochul, I think, is not exactly the uh, the darling of the downstate liberal Democrats, you know, and they figure she's better than having a Republican, but they're not terribly 
enthusiastic about her. And I think if she wants to uh, curry favor with them, she's certainly not going to put somebody on the court that would seem to be conservative or seem to be prosecution oriented. Um, I don't think she needs to put some flaming left winger on the court, but she certainly needs to put at least a moderate liberal on the court. And there are several on the on this list which would fill that bill. And if she does go with Judge Canataro, would she then need to find someone to replace him and start all over? Or would we likely see some of these names resurfaced? Yes. Well, you know, that's the beauty of elevating Kanataro to be chief judge, because that would create another vacancy and give her another opportunity to shape this court. Now, what would happen is once there was that vacancy on the court, then the commission would have to gather and go through the whole process again. But it's likely you might see some of the same names. Now, with regard to some of the same names, that brings up an, another really interesting point. There are individuals that you would expect to be on this list and aren't on the list. We mentioned the fact that there are no other current judges on the Court of Appeals on the list. I don't know how many of them actually applied, but I'm presuming at least one or two judges on the current court applied. They're not on. Uh, Caitlin Halligan, former Solicitor General of New York, clerked at the United States Supreme Court. She's been on several lists before. And of course, she's great. So Governor Andrew Cuomo passed her over several times. Erin Peridotto from the Fourth Department, the same thing. She's not on this list. I don't even know if she applied. Maybe she's so disgusted with the with the gubernatorial process because Andrew Cuomo passed her over several times. Elizabeth Gary, who is the presiding justice of the Third Department. I don't know again whether she, because it's all confidential whether they apply. She's not on the list. And, and as I said, what I think is really a disgrace is that Rowan Wilson, um, who's currently on the Court of Appeals, uh, wasn't on the list. And I'm presuming he did apply. So there is some real omissions on this list. It's a strong list, but there are some omissions that really stand out. Well, finally, do you think we're ever going to learn more about what might have actually caused the departure of Chief Judge Janet DeFiori from the State Court of Appeals? Her given explanation was basically, I, I saw the court through COVID and it's time to move on to other challenges. D do you expect we'll get more to this story at some point? I think somebody like you will find out more. You're giving about me too much credit. On. Way too much credit, Vin. I'll no, have to just I'll just really, interview that person you, afterward. Look, you you know uh, nothing is kept secret for too too long a time. And there are so many people interested in what the real story is. Somebody's going to leak what the real story is and uh you'll have me back on and I'll either contradict it or I'll, <laughs> I'll reaffirm it. Well, we've been speaking with Vin Bonventry. He's a professor with Albany Law School and author of the New York Court Watcher blog. Vin, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Always great to be with you, David. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals in education, human services, and health care. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.